So with that, I would like to welcome you all to the FHWA Pavements webinar series. This is the sixth and final webinar of the FHWA Pavements webinar series, which is focused on FHWA's pavement sustainability and resiliency program areas. Before I get started, I would like to introduce um, the webinar series as well as go over the platform some. For those of you, of you who do not know me, I am Heather Dilla and I'm one of the moderators of this webinar series and I am the Sustainable Pavements Program Engineer in FHWA's Office of Pre-Construction, Construction and Pavements. And in this role, I'm responsible for the pavement design policy, how tools such as life cycle cost analysis or life cycle assessment, which we'll hear about today, and resiliency can inform pavement designs or pavement design decision making. Helping me host this webinar series is Jen Albert, a pavement and materials engineer with the FHWA Resource Center. She has a background in pavement design and pavement management and works with me in the area of payment of the pavement design policy specifically. Um, since 2019, Jen and I have been reviewing our pavement design policy. Uh, Pavement design policy guidance and technical material and during this effort we held five peer exchanges with state agency representatives as well as FHWA division office representatives to discuss specifically the state of practice in pavement design and challenges or barriers to designing more pavements to best meet agencies missions and based on this feedback we created the idea of coming up with this webinar series all the topics in this series were ideas or topics of importance that were discussed during the peer exchanges and participants expressed interest in learning more. So um, that's how we created the, the various topics. And if you have any questions or feedback regarding this webinar series, please don't hesitate to contact Jen and I. Our email addresses are noted here. In addition, one of the outcomes of our outreach efforts is that we did determine that we needed to fix some of the ambiguities of our payment sign policy statement in which we have a proposed rulemaking and so um, later on we'll share with you the link at the at the conclusion of this webinar um, the link to get notice of that proposed rulemaking next slide jen so to get started here is the ms teams platform i hope most of you are familiar with these platforms already but if not it's always a good idea to um there's a camera icon on top and to turn off your camera when you're not speaking. Um, this helps with bandwidth. If you do want to ask a question during the question and answer session, you can raise your hand and Jen will be moderating that and she can call upon you and you can unmute your mic. Please everyone, it's good to keep an eye on your mic and make sure it's unmuted um, so we don't disrupt any of the speakers. Um, the hand icon is also up at the top if you look at the little smiley face with the hand, um, you can see there's a, uh, you can raise your hand there. You can also do thumbs up, applaud, whatnot. Um, and if you do have any questions throughout the presentation, we'll also be monitoring the chat, uh, feed, the conversation and chat for questions if need be. Next slide, Jen. So um, lastly, just for any best practices in joining um, MS Teams, if you do have any um, particular connectivity issues or, or you're not hearing us or something doesn't, you're not seeing the slides change, please log out and log back in. Sometimes that tends to be the, the best solution. You may want to check your browser. Um, we find that Google Chrome, Microsoft Edge, and Firefox tend to work the best. Um, and so that may help you as well. And again, just a reminder, please mute your mics when you're not speaking and hide your camera, turn off your cameras when you're not speaking. And if you do have any questions, feel free to use that, that chat feature. Um, in general, it's nice to put the at signal with the name of your presenter in the chat pod that will just give us in some insight of who particularly the convert or the question is geared towards. Um, next slide, Jen. So with that, I would like to take some time to introduce your speakers today. Um, I will be the first presenter, so you all know me, so I'm not going to spend time on uh, introduction to myself, but I would like to introduce you to two of my colleagues, Dr. Milena Rangeloff 
First, she is currently a visiting NRC postdoctoral fellow at the Federal Highway Administration, working with me in the Sustainable Pavements Program. Her research is focused on the integration of life cycle thinking into payment design, using EPDs to effectively, effectively achieve emission reductions and life cycle assessment of payment materials, de designs, and systems. Milena got her PhD at Washington State University, where she re her research focused on concrete durability and material characterization, as well as concrete pavements. And she has a bachelor's, bachelor's and master's in structural engineering from the University of Belgrade. Um, after that, we will have a presentation on resiliency from Dr. Amir Golalipur, and he's a highway research engineer in the FHWA's Office of Infrastructure Research and Development at Turner Fairbank. He, in this current role, he's responsible for planning, conducting, managing, and reviewing research and development research activities associated with infrastructure resiliency. He has been involved in numerous research and implementation projects in the asphalt pavement community since 2010, and he has his master's and PhD from the University of Wisconsin, Madison. He is also a licensed professional engineer. With that, next slide, Jen. We will begin the first section of our presentation on the sustainable payments program. And Jen, you can go to the next slide. Um, we always have acronyms. They're here for your reference. I'm not going to spend much time for them on them, so go ahead and advance. With that, I would like to introduce to you all the Sustainable Payments Program. It was launched back in 2010 by FHWA with the mission to advance the knowledge and practice of designing, constructing, and maintaining more sustainable payments. And over the last 10 years, this program has met with stakeholders 20, 21 times to be exact. We just met last couple weeks ago um, in March. We've get engaged more than a thousand people through our newsletters. There is a separate newsletter for the Sustainable Pavements Program um, specifically. We've had a separate webinar series and we do a series of educational outreach. In this presentation, I'm going to introduce you to some of the key deliverables over the that we've developed during these 10 years and kind of give you some insight on where the program is going moving forward. Um, with that, all of the resources that are that we're going to be covering, or the majority of them, unless I note otherwise, are available on our website. Next slide, Jen. Until recently, it wasn't really clearly how sustainability fit into FHW's payment program. And if you recall in our very beginning presentation of this webinar series, LaToya mentioned that FHWA was reorganizing some of our program areas to ensure a more coordinated strategic approach, um, specifically with the goal to provide tools and technical assistance to our stakeholders, being the, the state agencies, to optimize payment design, construction, and maintenance. And a major outcome of this effort is this image shown here. And I, what I really like about this image is sustainability is in the center of all of the other aspects of payment design. Um, and, and I do believe that's critical because sustainability touches all these other areas and we'll discuss on how that is um, in the remaining slides. Although, you know, it's not to say that the engineering performance isn't a focus area of FHWA or isn't even important to sustainability. I think you need both. Um, but sustainability really does define the overarching principles that we're tr trying to guide our decisions in order to meet our public needs. And that is to ensure environmental stewardship and mobility that is safe and cost effective. Um, we also have stakeholder groups, and I've just highlighted the ones here, and sustainability is one of the stakeholder groups that we have. Um, active. Next slide, please. One of the main challenges with sustainability is that there's no golden bullet solution. I think especially policymakers want that one solution that we can all deploy and make it easy and and um, move on from there. But it, it's not that way. It's really context sensitive and really should be incorporated early on into our engineering decision making process. When we evaluate our decisions, we can't just think about the initial impacts. It has an element of life cycle thinking because there's always trade-offs that can exist. And as such, uh, we will need innovations, we'll need improvements in all areas. And that means material design, pavement design, construction, preservation, maintenance, and our end of life and rehab. Um, there's innovations in each one of these stages that are equally as important and sustainability should be integrated into all of these um, phases of the decision making process. 
This requires, again, integration of the, these sustainability principles early on in the design decision making process so we don't miss any opportunities or cause unintended consequences um, moving forward. Next slide, Jen. So looking at FHWA's definition of sustain a sustainable pavement, it is um, right in line with FHWA's pavement and materials program mission as well, in that we do want to make sure we meet our engineering goals. Um, but not only do we want to deliver and manage our pavements to achieve these engineering goals, performance goals, but that we should also preserve or restore ecosystems or make sure that we're not negatively, negatively impacting them. Uh, make sure we use our financial and human resources wisely, our environmental resources as well, to meet a basic human need, which is the mobility in a safe manner um, through our roadway system. Next slide, Jen. To help us achieve this mission at FHWA, as I mentioned, FHWA has an active um, sustainable pavement technical working group. And part of this working group that is essential um, has been we encourage members from the various phases of the decision making process. So we have industry representatives from the raw material manufacturing or pavement materials manufacturing. We have pavement design engineers that sit on there, construction managers, um, as well as the maintenance and rehab side. We also have a mix of in industry stakeholders, academics, as well as state agency representatives. Moving forward, the stakeholder group, we just ended uh, the second phase of our program and we're starting up a new new phase of the of the sustainable pavement technical working group program this fall. And so we'll be looking for new members that want to be on as part of this stakeholder engagement uh, technical working group. So if you're an agency representative and interested in serving in this community, please let me know. Um, we're also going to clearly ex expand the topic areas that are discussed under this um, sustainable pavement technical working group to include economic analysis, which is essential to the uh, sustainability. So your LCCA, life cycle cost analysis, environmental analysis, such as LCA, that's been the focus in the past. And also we're beginning discussion on social indicators um, and how that fits into sustainability decision making for pavements. Specifically areas that you may think of for uh, social indicators could be safety or noise. Um, and then we're also pulling in that resiliency aspect, which we'll hear, hear from Amir later on today. Next slide. Um, just this slide is a timeline of the sustainable pavements program process uh, progress over the two phases of the program area. The first phase, we really just focused on documenting the state of knowledge. One of the main outcomes of that effort was the reference manual. And during the second phase, we really focused on implementation and encouraging the assessment in the environmental pillar of um, sustainability. Um, the, I'll go over some of the documents, but in general, this, this timeline does have a lot of different resources that were developed through our efforts, um, but we'll highlight them as well in the next uh, upcoming slides. Next. One thing that we learned in the documenting the state of knowledge is that it is important to assess our environmental, um, or important to assess this, the sustainability, the triple bottom line. Um, currently, many state department transportations are facing pressures to incorporate what I would call believed more sustainable practices or considerations. The most common pressure I would say is to incorporate some waste material, and it's usually done with the thought that this is more environmentally responsible. Um, that being said, you know, there's several other items that are common to engineers that we think are we're, we do as a what, what I would call as a feel good. To, because we think they're more sustainable, such as recycling or increasing durability in local materials. That, so that just gives you an idea. And I don't want you to get me wrong, none of these practices are bad, but the real issue is, have we actually quantified the environmental improvements or it could be the, the cost improvements of these practices? Um, specifically in relation to today's administration goals, the, the goals are related to climate mitigation, they're specifically asking how much greenhouse gases are associated with a conventional pavement or some of these these 
practices, these more innovative practices, or such as reusing a recycled material, and how much can we actually reduce in our greenhouse gas equivalents from using these technologies? And these are the questions in the future that we need to be asking and assessing, um, largely because we can't improve what we don't measure. So um, when you go next slide, Jen. So if you're looking at assessing sustainability, and this is the movement at which we're going towards, it's really about balancing that triple bottom line. You have three pillars. You have the social impacts, you have economic impacts and environmental impacts. In, for the past, DOTs have a, a much longer history in assessing the uh, economic impacts through life cycle, life cycle cost analysis. And there's many DOTs that incorporate life cycle cost analysis into their payment design decision making process. But when it comes to environmental, um, this is where the area of improvement is and this is where the area of focus is uh, moving forward. And the tool to do that is through life cycle assessment. Um, the second phase of our program area really focused on developing a framework and tools to help deploy life cycle assessment. And so a lot of today's presentation will give you the, the latest and um, our greatest knowledge of life cycle assessment for payment sign decision making. That being said, social is not something that should be forgotten. There are sustainability rating systems that cover various social aspects, such as INVEST, that's a FHWA program, but there's also a similar assessment technique called social LCA. And I envision the program area in the future will be looking at some of these broader social implications and how can we do similar, similar assessment tools um, to evaluating the social impacts of our decision making. Next slide. Critical to the success of our program area has been related to three areas, and that is one, building out that research arm. So in today's presentation, Melena is going to give an overview of some of the research we've been doing, always continually educating stakeholders through events such as today's, as well as working on deployment and working with the states hand in hand on case studies or um, piloting tools and providing um, various tools to help uh, make more sustainable decisions. Next slide. So we're going to go over some of the education um, components of the, of the sustainable payment program or resources available, and then I'll turn it over to Melena. Next slide. The first uh, resource that I would like to point you to is there was a, about a year ago, a 10 webinars or 10 webinars series. Um, all of these webinars are posted online and available on the FHWA YouTube channel, um, as well as there's a link on our Sustainable Payments web, um, webinar webpage. So this webinar series was created again with that reference manual that I mentioned in mind. So if you don't like reading, uh, it's a 500 page document reference menu, you could sit and look at or watch this webinar series. They are organized in there's five seminars that are focused on what's the sustainability basics, as well as more the assessment types types of techniques such as LCCA and LCA. And then there's five that are focused on highlighting some of these innovations that could potentially lead us to um, reducing those environmental, social or economic impacts. Next slide. Similarly, we have another resource that looks at these opportunities for more sustainable benefits, and that's the checklist. This is again created with that reference manual in mind, and it's interactive. So what you can do is, and what you can see on this slide here, if your eyes are good, um, I don't know how big it is for you all, but there's concrete mixed designs, and you could select what type of um, practices you have or you employ, and it will, when you submit it, it will give you a summary message that highlights just and starts to train you all to think of, well, what are potential environmental benefits of using these um, aspects? What are some of the social benefits and what are the economic? These are all potential. Um, it's very context specific, and that's why it's important that we use these tools such as LCA or LCCA um, to help us make more informed decisions. But that being said, this tool is just to get you to start thinking in that triple bottom line aspect of benefits or impacts. It also will provide then technical references. So if you're looking at employing, deploying something new, it will have a list of some technical resources 
for those practices as well. Next slide. We do have a series of tech briefs available. I think some of the most important tech briefs out there is the, the first one being on life cycle thinking. This one is a basic tech brief. If you don't know what the term LCA is or EPDs, that's OK. I, I don't expect everyone to know, but these are terms that are coming up and becoming more common as um, as decision makers are looking at uh, implementing more or reducing their greenhouse gas emissions specifically. And so to, the first tech brief gives you an overview of what are these acronyms. It's just very basic. And so if you don't know what it is, check it out. Or if you know some people that may need to know, you know, may need to know what they are and they're not aware of it, please reference those resources and provide them to your stakeholders as well. The second two tech briefs here, one is on EPDs and one is on LCA data needs. These are more in depth. This is when you know what an EPD is or you know what an LCA is. And um, Milena will go over some of these terms for you, but if you know what they are, and you're looking at using them and you want to know the technical details or nuances to using both those are the two tech briefs to go to for the that purpose next slide we also have a series of case studies that we um conducted all these case studies are using some sort of or some technology that was again in that reference manual um, that was highlighted and we tried to identify why did the state really look at it, deploying this sort of activity? What were the lessons learned? Um, as well as even if they did not quantify the economic or environmental um, benefits, we did try to add that as well if possible. So to uh, identify what could have been the, or the potential savings um, by deploying these technologies. So uh, five of these these case studies are posted on our website and we have five more that are going to be posted here in the next few weeks, I would say. Next slide. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Milena to go over some of our research initiatives. OK, thank you, Heather, and good afternoon, everyone. Jen, can I have the next slide, please? Uh, so my research uh, to support the needs of sustainable pavements program was mainly focused on environmental uh, lag of sustainability. Again, uh, for the reasons Heather specified earlier that we had a little more knowledge in the economic and then this one was more of an emerging area and then social obviously is coming up next. Uh, to quantify environmental impacts as opposed to those feel good decisions, uh, we have we're using the method called life cycle assessment and this method has been um, internationally standardized and used for numerous types of things numerous types of products across the industries and in the pavement sector we have shown that it can uh, lead to good outcomes and inform decisions in a meaningful way by considering environmental footprint uh, as its name suggests life cycle assessment is based on evaluation of the product throughout the life cycle uh, and to do that uh, we kind of cover all of the phases shown in this slide this is just for any generic product will show a more specific example for pavement but essentially we would start with raw material acquisition then we would have material processing manufacturing for our products we would have also a construction phase and then the use phase and lastly the product reaches the end of life in all of these phases, we have inputs in terms of materials and energy, and we have outputs in terms of products, uh, wastes and emissions. And to move things around, we're using different transportation steps, and these are the little trucks shown on this slide. Uh, so when I'm doing my LCA, I am covering, doing like a really good bookkeeping of all of the inputs, all of the outputs, and converting them into a range of environmental impacts. Uh, we are typically assessing more. We, we usually have the, the five impact categories, as I'll show, uh, but currently with current administration, global warming potential is an important one and life cycle assessment provides us standardized, quantifiable way to calculate uh, greenhouse gases uh, and any savings uh, that we can obtain. Next slide. Uh, so this uh, slide shows uh, one of our studies that we have developed in collaboration with six state DOTs all across the US. 
and we have investigated a fit of life cycle assessment to different phases of transportation decision making. LCA can be used pretty much for anything to measure the environmental impacts of your car, your cell phone, your T-shirt, as well as your pavement. And in transportation decision making, it has traditionally been considered uh, through environmental permitting or planning. And when it comes down to pavements, we usually think, oh, it's not our job. It doesn't pertain to us. However, we have shown in the study that better decisions can be made on many levels. But you need to know what type of decision is made on each level, what type of data do you have, and how can you inform uh, these decisions. So these blue boxes you can see in the middle are most generically like phases of decision making. So we start with long range plan that's very generic uh, with a 10 year focus and then things get more specific with programming or step phase and from step we which is a four year fiscally constrained plan we have project development and that's where the pavement design comes in and that's probably the phase m me and uh you guys probably feel the most comfortable with um which is more more focused and more specific but also for the project development we have the environmental permitting and then we have bidding um if you have design bid build phase bid build uh, mechanism of contracting which is the most common and construction that's when our structure becomes a reality uh and then the life cycle uh, use phase starts uh, and we are monitoring our assets, measuring different aspects of performance, traffic is operating, and based on that data, we are making decisions kind of how to uh, proceed in the future and close the loop. Uh, there is a lot more detail in this uh, reference that I'm showing, uh, but what I want to emphasize here is that LCA can be done on many levels. Uh, the highest level is consequential LCA in order to inform policy, and we'll talk a little bit about that um, regarding a, our case study with Puerto Rico. Um, and then uh, these color, this color coding, like a traffic light, shows us the readiness level. We have deemed, based on this study, that pavement, uh, the LC in support of pavement design is probably the most use ready, as well as uh, using construction, which is very potent phase to collect all sorts of data and inform the previous phases, which is indicated by these green arrows. Uh, we'll also talk a little more about the use of EPDs because that pertains really well to some of the state level initiatives. Uh, Jen, next slide, please. Uh, this pyramid has been the result of one of our TWIG meetings. Uh, basically, the que main question is how do you create policies and big picture uh, directions to support and ensure environmental improvements. However, it's not that easy. The system has to be built from the bottom up. And at the bottom, our LCA framework assessment. Think of it as a building code, like how do you do life cycle assessment? What are all the things that are relevant and how do you put them together? And we have done that uh, through our pavement life cycle assessment framework document done in the phase one. However, to bridge the bottom of the from the bottom of the pyramid to the top of the pyramid, we have big data needs. LCA method is relatively simple, but what's tricky is finding right and good data, and there are many data types. Uh, so in the second phase, we were focused on identifying the best data, helping the efforts of data development, cross uh, collaboration with different stakeholders. And lastly, we're ending with the tool that Heather will show at the very end, which is ready for deployment. Next slide, please. Speaking of pavement LCA, this is the product system specific again to pavement LCA. Again, we're starting on the left hand side with raw material acquisition. All of these materials are traveling to the asphalt plant. This is just an asphalt example. The same can be done for concrete. Uh, except that for binder, we would have Portland cement and we would have some SCMs in the water. Um, and we have that mixture. So all of these components are transported. These are these thick black arrows. And in the asphalt uh, plant, we are performing mixing uh, and producing asphalt mixture that then travels to the construction site where we are constructing the pavement. And then during the service life, we have maintenance and rehabilitation based on the performance. And lastly, pavement reaches the end of life and we decide what to do next. So in every phase, we have inputs in terms of materials and energy. We have outputs in terms of waste and emissions. Nothing new compared to the slide that I just showed. Uh, but 
every one of these phases uses energy in some shape or form, be it electricity or fuels and transportation to move things around. And this is what we call background data sets. We are not choosing uh, what our electricity grid will look like. We're just plugging our devices and using whatever grid we have, wherever we live or wherever we do our project. Um, so these are the background data sets that we have uh, worked on developing with an organization called, called Federal LCA Commons, and Heather will tell more about that, but I just want to plant this seed now. Um, also regarding materials, industry has done a lot of efforts to create EPDs, and on the left hand side you can see the portion of the data that's owned by material manufacturers and captured into EPDs. We currently have EPDs for most of the materials, for instance, for asphalt mixture, there is an EPD program for concrete mixture, the same thing. Um, and EPDs are small LCAs that just cover material production. Uh, so uh, in this slide, we are showing how EPDs can fit really nicely into pavement LCA and kind of inform that analysis. However, EPDs are only covering material portions, so we would like to use them further because it's not just about materials, it's about how do you use them and full life cycle is the best uh, way to think about that life cycle thinking again, uh, one of our key principles. Next slide. Okay, uh, I told a little bit about EPDs, so let's just dive a little deeper. So EPDs are eco labels that communicate environmental impacts of the product. Think of them as nutritional labels you would find on your granola bars or different other food products that tell you, you know, how much fat, carbohydrates and what have you. Uh, is contained in the unit of your food. Similarly, for our materials, we have a label that shows environmental impacts per unit of this material. It's calculated based on LCA, and what I like to emphasize is that this is a highly, highly standardized process that's based on industry consensus. And this process is developed through a document that's called PCR or Product Category Rule, so that everybody plays uh, under the same rules and EPDs ideally should be comparable and thereby uh, can inform uh, material selection. Currently, EPDs are not required by federal regulations, but states having expressed interest in using them, you have maybe heard of Bicling California Act. That is a legislation that has created a major wave and we have since seen similar acts uh, being considered in Colorado, Washington, Oregon, California. Many states are trying to follow this example and uh, make more informed decisions regarding material selection. Jen, next slide, please. Uh, we have a study in which we analyze the future of EPDs and how can we improve the standardization even more? Because EPD programs were developed by different program operators, often EPDs within one product category, say concrete or asphalt, are comparable, but then if we want to combine them into pavement designs and use EPDs as a data source, we may run onto some challenges and that's where industry um, dialogue has to come into play just to make this a system a little more robust and ensure environmental improvements of both materials as well as pavements. Um, so I will not drill uh, into further detail, but if you are more interested in the future of EPDs, I encourage you to check out this study or you can email me uh, and I can send you the paper. Next slide, please. Um, Case studies are always probably the most interesting when you see how uh, in real life uh, LCA can be used to inform decisions. And this study has been done uh, for uh, Puerto Rico. And Puerto Rico obviously is an island and they are grappling with an issue of excess waste tires. They have a lot of waste tires, mainly because they import used tires and tires don't have as long of life cycle. Uh, as they should have. Uh, the problem with this is that when tires are disposed of improperly, they collect the water, which is really fitting breeding ground for mosquitoes, and it presents health, health hazard because of uh, mosquito-borne diseases such as Zika, dengue, etc. Uh, and Puerto Rico lives off of tourism, and for them this represents huge public health as well as economic risk. And tires are also a fire hazard. Uh, and just like a bad practice of uh, waste management. 
so uh, currently what Puerto Rico is doing, they are shipping tires overseas to places like Costa Rica or India or Brazil to be burnt in cement kiln as tire derived fuel. Uh, however, they're looking for uh, local options because these markets are sometimes volatile and policies can change abruptly. Next slide, Jen. Um, this was a collaborative effort. Again, we really go above and beyond to do our studies in collaboration with many uh, relevant stakeholders. And in this case, we had many branches of uh, Department of Transportation, um, FHWA Resource Center, Puerto Rico Division Office, and then we worked with EPA uh, and of local agencies with PRHTA, which is Puerto Rico Highway Transportation Authority, and public officials who were interested in creating the policy to mandate use of ground tire rubber in local asphalt paving operations. Uh, we also had academic institutions, NCAT and University of Puerto Rico at, at Mayaguez. Next slide, please. Um, as I said, the, the idea of this policy is to grind these waste tires and try to use them in local paving operations. Uh, ground tire rubber has been a technology adopted in states such as Arizona, Nevada, California, Florida, New Jersey, and it can have some potential performance benefits uh, in terms of reduced rutting, uh, for improved safety uh, and some functional characteristics such as reduced noise. Uh, the question here was, can we really do that? And at what scale, what would be environmental repercussions of this practice? So we have done the study. Uh, so we had LCA done just on pavement sections. Puerto Rico already has two pavement sections, which we analyzed. And then uh, the other one was on the island level, systemic level to see what consequences would policy have on environmental impacts and uh, tight waste tires on the island. Next slide, please. Uh, so in this slide, I'm showing product systems for these two pavement sections. They were constructed seven years ago and they're performing well. Uh, NCAD has done uh, in-situ inspection in 2019 and they have uh, concluded that GTR modified section has equal or improved performance compared to the conventional HMA counterpart. Uh, these were essentially uh, like overlays where they tried this material. They were only two inches thick. Uh, however, um, they wanted to do an in situ implementation just to see if this material can perform well in the local context because uh, Puerto Rico generally uses conventional hot mix asphalt. Uh, these two product systems, as you can see, are very similar. Again, we have all these constituents that I talked about that are going into the mixing plant. We have construction and then we have end of life. Uh, because they are so thin, we are assuming that maintenance is essentially the end of life. Uh, because they commonly do two inch mill and fill. Um, and uh, the differences between the two, however, is that GTR requires substantial energy to be ground into a fine powder that can be used as binder modifier. So here we're going to have another step of binder modification at high temperature for a period of time and then mixing. When we add ground tire rubber, the asphalt binder will have increased viscosity and it will demand higher mixing temperature. So this mix would have also a little higher mixing energy. Uh, next slide, please. So here I'm showing results and I'm comparing conventional pavement section, which is a solid blue um, series, and I'm comparing that to GTR modified pavement section. And we have five environmental impact categories acidification potential, eutrophication potential, uh, that is fertilization of water sources, global warming potential, these are greenhouse gases, ozone depletion potential, that's the destruction of ozone layer. Uh, as you can see here, these impacts are normalized to US production, therefore ozone is very low because we usually don't use a lot of refrigerants. And lastly, smog creation potential, uh, that is usually the function of fossil fuel combustion and usage. So we have five impacts, not just one, uh, and thereby we have somewhat comprehensive picture of environmental footprint. Uh, here, uh, when we compare section to section directly uh, from uh, cradle to belt scope, 
we can see that GTR1 has higher impacts by 20 to 30 percent, depending on the impact category. So why is that? Uh, that's because all of the reasons I listed before. We have extra energy to grind GTR. We need extra energy to modify the binder and we need extra energy to uh, mix. Uh, and all of that sums up to 20 to 30 percent. However, this doesn't capture the whole story because we need to consider the full life cycle. And GTR's um, mix can, in certain contexts, have improved performance and improved durability. Um, Jen, can, can we go to the next slide? So in this slide, we are showing how much service life of GTR section has to be extended in order to break even or be considered environmentally equal to our conventional HMA section. Uh, we are assuming 10 year life. Uh, as I said, these sections are thin and can effectively be considered as overlays. So if our baseline HMA solution lives for 10 years, in order to break even, GTR1 has to live uh, or uh, present good performance for 12 years or so, like extend performance by that much. And that's how durability figures in. So durability indeed can be a good practice, but with LCA, we have the mechanisms to quantify that and show the benefits. Uh, next slide, please. So this slide is consequential LCA and it's a little more complex. So we have analyzed this system, island as a system, and they have about three almost 4 million waste tires every year. And usually these tires are burned in cement kilns overseas. We assume Costa Rica scenario. We have some other scenarios as well. Uh, and we say, OK, uh, this is your business as usual. What if you divert portion of it to pavement? So the first question was, how much can you divert? The answer was not that much. We calculated that it's between 8 and 16 percent. So in this scenario, we are going with 12 percent. And again, this would be a substantial stretch for pavement system because it would require more than 80 percent of pavements to be GTR modified. And on the left hand side, so we have business as usual scenarios where we ship all the tires to be burned and then we have modified scenarios when we divert portion of them into GTR and into pavements. Uh, so in the first set of scenarios, uh, kiln fuels are not environmentally friendly. And when we do that, uh, when we divert tires into GTR, we are doing environmental damage because tires are really well used when they are replacing environmentally intensive fuels, such as the combination of coal and petroleum coke. However, on the left hand side, when tire derived fuel or TDF replaces greener fuel combinations, such as the ones with natural gas, uh, the two scenarios become equal and it becomes much more better, much better use of waste tires to be ground into GTR and used in pavements. So uh, when we in the future move towards cleaner energy resources, uh, ground tire rubber will become more and more beneficial. However, for now, for Puerto Rico's case, uh, pavements have limited capacity to consume waste tires and then uh, fuel that's being replaced in the kilns is another important thing to think about. Next slide, please. Coming back to this slide uh, one more time, um, we talked about consequential LCA for policy level decisions and a little bit about pavement design and EPDs. Jen, can you click? We have a little animation. Um, one more area of interest was asset management because many states have started, um, I mean, asset management has been a practice for a long time, but now states are submitting TAMPs, transportation asset management plans that are based on financial life cycle planning, and we were investigating pathways to integrate environmental considerations there. Next slide. Um, currently, we deemed level uh, of readiness is medium and medium low for phase one and two. The main barrier is the lack of data for different maintenance and preservation treatments, et cetera. Uh, so the first phase ideally would be extensive data collection and tracking. And then in phase two, LCA could be performed jointly with life cycle planning. However, we need data to do that. Next slide, please. Um, and you have probably seen classical pavement deterioration curve where we have 
uh, the uh, pavement condition dropping and we can um, increase it uh, and improve it uh, using different um, MNR treatments or preservation treatments depending on pavement condition, etc. And currently through pavement management systems, we are generally collecting uh, pavement conditions, uh, everything that's in white boxes. So pavement conditions, treatment timing, type, cost, what's condition improvement and how long uh, the, 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 the treatment would last, how long the effects would be. So then uh, adding this environmental component, which are gray boxes, usage of materials and use of construction equipment, and in some cases traffic detours would not be too much of a stretch because uh, asset management already relies on substantial amount of data. However, we currently don't have the relevant data and we are collaborating with industry to uh, create EPDs for different treatments and different materials and just support this area a little more in the future. Next slide, please. Yes, and this is the end of the research portion. I will turn uh, over to Heather to tell us about our deployment activities. Actually, Melinda, real quick, we're going to stop because there's been a few questions regarding the topic of your study. So we're going to stop and ask some of those questions here to give a little pause. Um, so first question, is there a significant distribution or I think it's means significant difference between crumb rubber tire and ground tire rubber? Uh, I think uh, it. Yeah, the, the, the person is asking a valid question. I think there is a little difference that crumb rubber is finer um, based on what we have or on Puerto Rico uh, facilities and their interest and what what is more used in the US we were focused on ground tire rubber um, and I can send you some documents if you want about uh, the specific difference uh, there is also difference between uh, Vulcanization, devulcanization, cryogenic grinding, regular grinding. So in our study, we had GTR and we had regular grinding on the ambient temperature. That's uh, that's what's considered in our product systems. And then here I see the question: How many tires are used in ton in a ton of asphalt? Uh, let me look into my um, data and give you a number. We will. Is there any other questions? Yeah, well, it's like nine percent binder, and I am blanking on the exact percentage of GTR. So I can I can definitely look into that just to give the exact number. If and does anyone have any other questions for Melena or what we presented so far? If so, you can raise your hand. Yes, uh, I see uh, research compared environmental impacts of burning them at cement kiln versus in pavement. So yes, we have the system that includes both pavement and kilns and uh, we vary these combinations. Uh, other ways to use tires uh, is one is closed loop recycling, which is use of ground tire rubber to produce new tires um, and it's deployed to certain extent they were looking for a local option one more local option is usage in thermal power plants um, and they have proposed that uh, for some reason uh, the kind of the proposition of our study was to compare uh, GTR in pavements versus these business as usual options uh, which is kills. Any other questions? If not, I'm going to quickly wrap up uh, the presentation for the sustainable payments part of this session, and then we'll turn it over to Amir to discuss a different topic, but somewhat related to the topic of resilience. Next slide, Jen. So Milena did mention we are working on an LCA tool. Um, the, the LCA tool is officially called LCA PAVE. What is unique about this tool is it was created with stakeholder input. Um, as well as uses those publicly identified background data sets and incorporates, incorporates EPDs. So you can add in EPDs if you're an agency looking at um, collecting them and, and you can incorporate them into the tool itself. Next slide. 
The tool does have it's Excel based, so it's pretty simple to use and it has a customizable library. So that's where you would enter in those EPDs. Um, when you enter in any data that you do collect, there's a metadata um, indicator there field so you can evaluate the data quality and add any information so you know exactly what the source is of that data. The public data sets that we do use are from the federal LCA Commons. This is a group of other federal agencies that are all working in the area of life cycle assessment and we are trying to ensure that we're using standard approaches that are consistent amongst all the agencies. Some of our members are from EPA, um, USDA, DOE, Department of um, Energy, DOD, Department of Defense, FAA is also getting um, engaged in this group as well. Next slide. The tool will allow you to assess material choices. It can also be used for a broader payment design or any of those treatments, um, payment management treatments that you may want to look at. It could, it was not created for structures or bridges, but there, I don't see any reason why you couldn't use it also for structures. Um, some of the comparisons you could make is material sources, following alternatives, uh, various end of life strategies, just to name a few. If you're interested in helping us pilot the tool or to work on any topic related to sustainability, what we discussed um, earlier today, or what we're going to discuss related to resiliency, there is a pooled fund demonstration project. The link is here to get more information. But if you do join this pooled fund, it does give you $250,000 in funds and 100 hours of technical assistance for approved projects. So just something to think about if you have um, uh, any anything topic that comes to mind related to today's conversations. Next slide. In general, we're going to continue working with the federal LCA Commons. So we've been actively participating in creating a roadmap for background data sets. Uh, we hope that these background data sets would be incorporated not only into our LCA tools that were being developed, but the um, product category rules of uh, construction materials in the future. And we have specifically some guidance out there that is under review and, and we sought public comment on. And so we're right now in the process of addressing those comments and releasing that. Next slide. Right now, the any of our resources are available on our website. My contact information, Melena's, as well as my team lead, Latoya's, are here if you have any questions um, for us. The tool right now is not published online just because we're trying to get some educational content to go along with it. And so we're trying to get that through the publication process. But as soon as it is, um, we will make sure you guys are all aware and notified. Um, I would also note that we have a different um, listserv. There's two emails. There's one for the payments group that we've mentioned a lot on this webinar series. The Sustainable Payments Program also has a email listserv that we send monthly. So if you go to that website, um, please sign and you're interested in these topic areas, please sign up to our email list. With that, let's if, if there aren't, we'll turn it over to Amir and if there's questions on my program on sustainability in general, I'll try to answer them in chat and if we have time at the end, we'll we'll answer further questions. OK, uh, can you guys hear me? You're good. Awesome. Um, so thanks, Heather. Um, as Heather mentioned, I'm going to talk um, about the uh, resilience and some of the efforts that we are um, doing for ba basically uh, going toward more resilient pavements. Uh, before getting to my presentation, um, I would like to acknowledge uh, um, Heather and Elizabeth. Uh, we are working together on, um, on a lot of these efforts. Um, Heather is part of our Office of uh, Pre-Construction and Construction Pavements and Elizabeth Habeck. She's part of our Office of Planning, Environment and Realty. Uh, myself, I'm part of the Office of Infrastructure Research and Development and uh, part of the Infrastructure Analysis and Construction Team, part of the Turner Fairbank Highway Research Center. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, uh, before uh, basically getting the discussion regarding the resilience, we need to define uh, what uh, what's the resilience means. And uh, one of the things that uh, we have a definition from Federal Highway for resilience is the ability to anticipate, 
prepare for and adapt to changing condition and understand, respond to and recover rapidly from disruption. And this is from FHWA order 5520. So why is the issue of extreme weather resilience so important to Federal Highway and our partners? Uh, the reason is that because community across the United uh, States are experiencing extreme weather events that damage roads and bridges and cause large sum of um, um, money to repair them and is also uh, impacting the economy because of the disrupted travel. Just an example of that, beside those pictures that I have that I'm going through them, just what happened um, a couple of weeks back in Texas that it disrupted a lot of basically travel activities and also it damaged a lot of the infrastructure. So that's something that we need to start being prepared for. Uh, these pictures that I put here, as you can see, is from California. Um, 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 and then the next one is from the Colorado is because of the uh, wildfire situation that they had. And then uh, next one is from Iowa, uh, some of the flooding situation they had. And the last one is from um, New, York, New York City. It was basically because of the Superstorm Sandy. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, the next one, uh, uh, we want to talk about uh, some of the policy that is in place about uh, um, extreme weather resiliency. Improving the durability of the nation's transportation infrastructure has always been the key of the Department of Transportation and Defense Federal Highway. As a result of that, resilience is cited in many policies and regulations. Two of them are here. One of them is basically US DOT, uh, a strategic plan for 2019 to 20. To 22, and the other one is FHWA Order 5520 that I mentioned regarding the definition of the resonance is coming from there. Next slide, please. So, just to understand some of the environmental impacts on pavements, I put um, this slide. This is uh, related to the study that was done in Turner Fairbank Highway Research Center back in 2016. And this is a result from the campaign, the LTPP specific pavement studies experiment. And uh, this study uh, was looking at, on environmental effects in absence of the heavy load. So they want just to look at how the environmental factor is going to contribute to pavement distresses. And as you can see, 36% um, of total damages for flexible payment was coming from the environmental factors and for the rigid payment was 24%. So we can see that a significant amount of those uh, damages and distresses was just coming uh, basically only from the uh, environmental impact. And one of the things that we need to consider uh, in payment design of the climatic data that we use is assume a stationarity. So we don't use a projection and that has impact. Uh, in case you would like to um, read more about this uh, study, you can um, um, basically go to the link that I put here um, to get more information about this uh, study. Could you please go to the next slide? So here, uh, um, as I mentioned, um, in the pavement design, we are uh, using a stationarity uh, climatic data, so we don't look at the projection. Um, so what happens if we don't use, look at the projection? For example, if we have higher average temperature, it's going to impact our flexible pavement in terms of rotting and shoving. Um, uh, so we may need uh, to use some other materials that is more rot resistant. Um, also, it's going to increase the age hardening of the asphalt binder. So basically your asphalt binder is going to age faster. So it, it um, that could be um, some issue in terms of the cracking um, um, in, uh, in further years of the life of your pavement. Moisture changes, it could have some issues on your soil uh, properties, swelling, um, and also it could uh, impact your uh, pavement stiffness if you have a drought. And uh, increased precipitation is going to impact your structure capacity because of the level of saturation of your soil. Uh, we have um, a link here that you can get more information, detailed information about some of this impact. Next slide, please. So now we want to talk about um, how we can use this um, information and the tools that we have and apply that to our pavements. Next slide, please. So um, the first thing that in the adaptation strategies that we need to do is monitor the trends. Um, you know, to uh, we have these different tools 
and um, um, we have published um, an article in Public Rose that the, 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 the link is um, basically attached to this slide. Uh, for pavement and bridges, the first approach that we need to do is monitoring the trends. Just, just to look at it, what's happening if the distresses or environmental uh, factors are changing in a different rate that we are expecting, and if it is, then it it worthwhile to investigate further. But for now, we can just monitor and see how those distresses are going to uh, be impacted in future. Uh, in that table, you can see, for example, for asphalt payment, some of the indicators are like, for example, rotting, cracking, and other type of um, distress. And for the concrete pavement, you can look at the blow ups or a slab cracking or other issues. Next slide, please. So after that, you looked at um, basically monitoring the trend, then you need to evaluate um, the vulnerability of your system. Um, and um, for that, you can use the vulnerability assessment scoring tool. This tool is developed by um, uh, by Federal Highway uh, um, Office of uh, uh, Environmental. So um, as you can see, it has different steps to it. Uh, because of the time, I'm not going through all the details, but we have a lot of those information uh, uh, documented. However, the objective of this, this tool is to identify if an asset is more vulnerable than the other part of your system and how you can put a priority for uh, for different assets in your system and if they are at higher risk. And in the approach, you can use this tool and uh, using some of the local data. Uh, this is an indicator based vulnerability assessment tool. So as part of the, um, you know, as part of a, the pilot project, some of the state, they use this uh, tool and customize it. One of those states is Maryland, um, that we have some of those information available uh, in our website. Next slide, please. So, and the last uh, step after um, basically assessing that risk is how we can plan and design our infrastructure to meet the future conditions. And we call this process is an ADAP or Adaptation Decision Making Assessment Process. It's a risk-based approach for planners, designers, and engineers. And as you can see, you can start from understanding uh, the basically the site contrast, and then you can go through different uh, steps to uh, basically uh, find your adaptation plan or the, the new design that you need to do. And this is at a network level that we do, um, and you can tailor that to your um, a specific project or tailor to your specific estate. Um, and um, um, there is a link here in case you're interested to look at that tool. Next slide, please. So uh, we are using uh, with the, uh, we we have done some cases said that we already use this tool. So I'm going I'm going to um, discuss about a couple of those projects again due to the lack of time. Um, we couldn't put uh, many of those, but um, we are sharing some of those links that you can go and see more of those studies. Next slide, please. So this is uh, um, some of those adaptation cases studies that uh, we have done. Uh, um, and you can see, uh, we call them ticker says so transportation engineering approaches to climate resiliency. And um, there are like uh, five of those that I listed in this table that I'm going um, to explain a little bit about like the Texas one, Virginia one and Maine one. Um, next slide, please. So the first one that I'm going to talk a little bit is a Texas State Highway 170. In this study, the focus was to look at the impact of the temperature and precipitation um, on the performance, pavement performance. The project scope was uh, related to an area in Dallas, Texas, and the proposed project was a new construction. So we wanted to look at how we can use the adaptate, adaptative process to come up with a newer um, um, design approach. And uh, we wanted to use the pavement performance using mechanistic and predicate pavement uh, prediction models, and also using some of the project, uh, projected climatic data, not the stationary data, and see how um, that's going to uh, plan, pan out for our design. Next slide, please. So uh, for that, for the future temperature changes, we use some of those climatic model. 
Uh, here you see that three uh, models, they call it RCP 4.5, 6, and 8.5. For some of you that you may not be uh, familiar with, RCP is basically a representative concentration pathway. It's a greenhouse gas basically uh, kind of model that based on that they have a trajectory to see what what's happening to the temperature changes and as you can see there um, and 8.5 is basically the most extreme one and 4.5 is kind of the most conservative one but any of them you look at you can see the increase in the temperature um, uh, in the next um, 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 hundred years and what's happening and you can see the increase basically from 65 degree Fahrenheit from now to above uh, uh, 75 degrees. So um, if you look at the RCP 8.5, so that's a lot of changes. That's even more than, for example, for flexible payments, that more than a grade of asphalt binder. So that's that's why it's important to look at some of those projections. Next slide, please. The other one is basically we are looking at the moisture changes. Uh, the thorn white moisture index that we are using is a useful indicator of the supply of water, basic precipitation in an area relative to the demand for water um, and uh, basically under prevailing climatic conditions. Um, and you can see we, again, uh, we are using the same RCP models and we are looking at the projections. And based on some of those projections, uh, we have um, the risk of um, getting very kind of dry and then when you have drought situation uh, um, your soil is going to change and also your pavement performance is going to change so that's something that you need to look at it next slide please so here um, basically we are summarizing the impact on the flexible pavement and as you can see uh, we have the new construction we have the rehabilitation uh, scenario one and rehabilitation scenario two and the difference between them is basically the time range for them and you can see uh, how much rotting uh, or how much uh, basically cracking uh, we can expect um, here we are specifically using the most ex extreme cases that was RCP model 8.5 but you can see that's a significant amount of spe specifically the for asphalt concrete layer rotting uh, you know, it could go up to more than 30%. So that means that we need to change our binder grade from PG70 to PG76. So that's that's all the whole grade change. Next slide, please. The next one, we are looking at how this climatic uh, projection is going to impact our rigid pavements, um, where we can, uh, we are going to have like some drying shrinkage uh, that's increased at two and a half percent uh, because of the change in the, humi uh, the humidity. And uh, also, we are going to have some more um, uh, accelerated dry shrinkage because of changing the ambient temperature. Uh, for some of the other distresses, we may not have any, any changes, but it's good to document uh, all of those. But basically, based on the, situ the situation with the curling stresses, the crack with um, issues, um, using a higher steel in a continuously reinforced concrete pavements is suggested based on those projections. Next slide, please. So if uh, we want to just um, summarize that in a lesson learned kind of um, summary for this project, we saw that the increasing temperature and aridity will affect material properties, and that's obvious. So you are going to have uh, more, um, uh, more drawing of your soil um, so that may help you in case of uh, subgrade support. However, you may have softening of your asphalt or shrinkage in your concrete that is going to uh, cause more distresses. Uh, there are some limitations about this study that is listed here. But um, what I would take from some of this to say that uh, it's in, uh, based on this study, more resilient payment strategies is already exist. And when you are looking at this adaptation strategy, it's not going to uh, cost you that much significant more of money. So uh, if you start using some of these adaptation process, it could help you in long term um, and saving more money um, for your estates. Next slide, please. This is another study. It's a case study in Virginia. 
uh, it was in Carroll County, and that was specifically related to the soil and the slope. Um, basically, they were trying to look at the sensitivity to climate change and how that's going to impact your rock slope weathering and if they need to do any type of changes um, or any type of adaptation process. There is a tech brief on um, and they use the tech brief that Federal Highway put together on climate change adaptation for pavements uh, for their study. And uh, that area is, if you are familiar in Virginia, is close to I-77 uh, um, um, in Cal County, Virginia. Next slide, please. So, uh, we, have, we know that uh, based on the projection, um, some of the precipitation and temperature could change and that's going to impact your rock and soil stability. Um, so here, basically, uh, we are showing the picture from that area on the left-hand side, and then I'm basically using the Google map showing the overall area. Hopefully, it's not just too small for you guys, but you can see it's right um, by I, um, um, Interstate Highway 77. And as I mentioned, uh, the purpose was to evaluate the potential impacts of the uh, projected changes in terms of precipitation and freeze and so cycle and slope stability. Um, so next slide, please. So they uh, they use the analytical approach for that. Um, although the research team developed detailed um, projections of the future precipitation levels, um, um, but also they use um, a, par a parametric analysis. So basically, they vary different key contributors to a slope failures. For example, the groundwater elevation or soil unit weight uh, to determine the response of the slope under the wide range of the conditions. And uh, basically to see that, for example, if a slope is, is, steep, is um, a steeper than two um, to one, is it going to be an issue or not? And they did uh, fill um, fill inspections um, to look at if there are some issues with the soil, um, and as I mentioned, they did the parametric analysis to understand the um, the difference response based on the different range of conditions. Next slide, please. So uh, this is basically the uh, adaptive uh, basically management um, that they use. Uh, um, in the in this study, also the slope was not projected to impacted by climate change. Uh, they may continue to um, weather and slide. So uh, VDOT uh, has taken that adaptive design approach. Um, they are taking adaptive action in phases, basically monitoring the results and environmental projections, and looking at that in future how they may need to adapt to it. Uh, the adaptation strategy used by VDOT in this case are the standard type of practices that are normally used for this type of situations. Although this design was created under uh, basically today climatic condition, but it will serve VDOT in future. However, looking at the uh, climate projection is very important in this type of analysis. Next slide, please. So some of the lesson learned was that um, increased Precipitation may not increase the likelihood of a slope failure. Um, so that is important to look at it and assess that using different tools to, to see that was your threshold. And um, sometimes the detailed type of climatic data are not necessary for an initial you know, general assessment, but maybe uh, further in your study, uh, you may need more kind of uh, detailed data. And rather than a screening detailed climate change projection as like the worst case scenario, uh, uh, you can analyze uh, without a specific climate data. Next slide, please. So this one is on, on, on main study. Um, again, because of the lack of time, I just put a couple of a slide on that. But in this study, they were trying again to look at how uh, the temperature and precipitation can impact on the pavement performance. Uh, they were looking at the existing two-lane rural asphalt highway uh, with seasonal load allowances and restriction. And they want to look at the pavement performance, again, using uh, mechanistic empirical pavement performance prediction models. Next slide, please. And just basically some of the lesson learned from this study was that uh, they could have some increased rutting and cracking. Uh, so 
what they could do to prevent that increasing their pavement thickness or maybe use polymer modified binder um, because um, for their flexible pavement and some of the seasonal policies for the truck load restriction uh, to make sure that uh, they are minimizing um, the distresses on the pavement uh, because of the uh, change in the freeze and thaw cycle maybe and they have this early spring melts um, maybe they need to change that weight uh, basic threshold by at least you know by four weeks and they need to look at the economic impacts of that on the trucking um, and the, the link for these studies are um, in this slide next slide please so these are some of our uh, resources that we have um, and the one that I was talking about it was about you know I talked about the vulnerability and adaptation framework we have that resource I talked about different ticker studies that we have uh, we have some other engineering guidance documents HEC 25 and 17 you can look at it we had some golf studies so we have a lot of uh, resources that you can um, 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 utilize them um, and you can go just to uh, the Federal Highway website for environment and then slash sustainability slash resilience and you get all of these resources that we already developed. Next slide, please. So now I want to um, transition to some of our current and some of our ongoing efforts to just uh, to provide a little bit of summary of some of the activities that right now we are um, conducting. Next slide, please. Uh, the first one is is a um, project that we are doing with uh, with NOAA, uh, and we are trying to look at the effect of sea level rise. This is a joint project with National Center for Coastal Ocean Science, and the goal for this project specifically is to look at the uh, uh, inform adaptation planning and coastal management decision, and we are trying to um, take a multidisciplinary research approach to it and looking at the climatic models and also uh, tools of the dynamic physical and biological process for that and looking at the basic impact of the sea level rise in this project it has two parts the first one is coastal resilience focus area the second part that is basically our focus is surface transportation resilience focus area next slide please so um in the surface transportation resilience focus area, as you can see, we want to quantify the vulnerability of our surface transportation system. And that means that not only the payments, we are looking at you know, uh, railroads and other type of um, uh, surface transportation, and uh, also quantify the social, economic, and ecological benefits. And also looking at how we can predict the, the impact of the sea level rise and inundation and how we can minimize the, the, the risk. You know, uh, while existing literature describes some of these damage mechanism to the uh, pavement due to the coastal flooding, you know, like loss of subgrade, uh, subgrade from wave attacks, or if delamination happens or, you know, failure of subgrade and different things happens, um, um, transportation agencies still, they need the ability to estimate the extent, the timing, frequency and cost of the future coastal flooding and that's why uh, we think that this study is uh, really useful uh, the extent of the road damage from a given flood event uh, for example high tide uh, high tide flooding or a storm surge um, you know that depends on a number of factors related to the flood event for example flow velocities wave forces lengths of time of the inundation depths of the inundation and a lot of those other factors so we are trying to uh, cover all of those in this project. Next slide, please. So um, um, uh, we we are looking at different gaps and future needs, and based on that, we are trying to put together kind of like a roadmap for resilient pavements. We already conducted uh, peer exchanges. We had a pavement resilience peer exchange, and uh, we we conducted a highway resilience to wildfire events. So based on that, we are trying to gather what's what's the information is out there and what is the where are the gaps and what's the future needs. And one of the things that we have learned is about the education part of it, that we need to educate our pavement engineers on the resiliency and also identify specific approaches for more resilient pavements. And uh, 
part of this peer exchange, we want to document the state of the knowledge. Um, and as I mentioned, that education is important. So some of the resources available to incorporate more resilience practice that we are trying to put that together. We are working to put together an NHI resilience course. And as I mentioned, we are trying to put together a payment resilience, um, like a technical guidance just to document some of the state of the knowledge. And um, just, just to, um, to provide um, a little bit more information about some of these peer exchanges, based on those peer exchanges, uh, it seems that uh, the inundation and flooding is one of the major issues that state DOTs uh, they are basically uh, working on it right now because a lot of our coastal states they are impacted by that, or some of the, our midwestern states they are impacted by the midwestern flooding and those type of things. So um, it seems that the flooding issue is one of the ones that is. Uh, happening right now, and a lot of people they need to look at it, but also other stuff like. Um, um, some of the extreme type of weather, like what happened in Texas a couple of weeks back or wildfire that's happening in the West Coast now more frequently. Those are some of the things that we are trying to look at and provide information uh, for our stakeholders. Next slide, please. And um, basically, lastly, how you can help. Uh, we can encourage your agencies to consider resilience in planning, design and operations. I know that a lot of the states, they already took that uh, basically a step and they are uh, putting together a specific program programs on resiliency and also help us uh, disseminate some of the resources that we have. We talked about the case studies, we talked about the uh, vulnerability assessment, we talked about adaptation decision making assessment process and tools. So these are all the tools that we have um, and is available. So it's uh, it would be uh, great to um, disseminate um, uh, with our uh, community and stakeholders and definitely continue research. That's basically part of my program to continue research on those gaps that basically we are identifying uh, for not only payment but infrastructure as a as a whole uh, in terms of resilience. Uh, with that, um, can we go to the next slide? I'm wrapping up my presentation. Uh, these are the uh, contact information for Heather, Elizabeth, and myself. If you have any further question regarding resiliency, you can reach out to any of us, um, and I would be uh, happy uh, to engage any questions you may have. I think Elizabeth um, is also uh, here um, um, today with us, so in case if you guys any have any questions, all of us, uh, uh, we would be happy to help you. Thank you. Thank you, Amir. Amir. If there are any there questions, any questions? Could, could you raise, raise your, your hand? hand? Right now, I don't see anything in the chat. If not, I think we'll move on um, to the to wrap up this presentation today. Um, and if you do again, if anybody has any questions for any of the speakers today, you guys have our contact information. With that, um, this is the last webinar of our webinar series, so this concludes our events. We are recording all of these sessions and looking to post these online. And we are developing a website specifically for pavement, the pavement design policy that would have links to a lot of the summary reports that we reference um, from those peer exchanges, the listening sessions. It would also have links to all of these webinars that you see, see today or, or through the past couple months, um, and as well as any ongoing updates from our rulemaking. Jen's going to post a link to the notice of rulemaking here as well as a link to join that newsletter. So ultimately, um, please make sure you're part of our newsletter to get any of the latest updates from our program area, the Pavement Disciplines program area. Next, Jen. Slide. Um, I would also like to let you guys know of another webinar being hosted by SIVA from Turner Fairbank on the remaining service interval. And this is part of payment lifecycle management framework in, and is intended to help highway agencies make 
sound long term investment decisions. So this webinar will outline the fundamentals of the concepts associated with the remaining service interval and that framework. Um, we'll present the basic process of its application and provide some simple um, use case ex examples. So I encourage you guys to join us for that webinar. It's upcoming in April on Wednesday from 2 to 3.30. Uh, an announcement will be included in our pavement, um, again, newsletter. But it is free and open to all stakeholders. Next slide. Then lastly, as always, to conclude our webinar series, we would like you to provide us any feedback um, on how we can improve, any ideas for future webinars. To help us provide that feedback, um, Jen's going to post a link to our survey, or you can click on www.menti.com and put in the code that is listed here. Um, you can enter that uh, eight-digit number um, in there and get access to the survey. If you want a copy of the presentation or those professional development hour certificates, you must fill out that survey and put your email in the last um, question. That's how I get everybody's email address and I'll send out the certificates. To date, I have sent out all certificates of all the events up to this one. So if you, you didn't get an email from me and I'm missing one, please reach out um, and we'll get that to you. With that, I would like to thank you for joining us for this webinar series. And again, if you have any questions or comments, both Jen and my contact information is noted here. Thank you and have a good day. Mm -hmm.